Well then today we have the Mass of St. John the Apostle and uh, December 27th we'll be here again in Corona in California here and the Epistle for this Mass of St. John is taken from the Book of Ecclesiasticus chapter 15 He that fear of God will do good and he that possesseth his justice shall lay hold on her, and she will meet him as an honorable mother, with the bread of life and understanding. She shall feed him, and give him the water of wholesome wisdom to drink, and she shall be made strong in him, and he shall not be moved, and she shall hold him fast, and he shall not be confounded, and she shall exalt him among his neighbors, and in the midst of the church she shall open his mouth, and she shall fill him with the spirit of wisdom and, and understanding, and shall clothe him with a robe of glory. And the Lord our God shall heap upon him a treasure of joy and gladness, and shall cause him to inherit an everlasting name. And in the Gospel, taken out according to St. John, chapter 21. And at that time Jesus said to Peter, Follow me. Peter, turning about, saw that disciple whom Jesus loved, following, who also leaned upon his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is he that shall betray thee? Him therefore, then Peter had seen, when him therefore when Peter had seen, he saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus saith to him, so I, so I will have him to remain till I come. What is it to thee? Follow thou me. This saying therefore went abroad among his brethren, that that disciple should not die. And Jesus did not say to him that he should not die, but so will I have him to remain till I come. What is it to thee? This is that disciple who gave testimony of these things and hath written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Thus for the words of today's Holy Gospel. Well then, the Father, the Son, the Ghost, amen. Just a few considerations. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. That's fine. So then, um, the Gusari is a day on the feast of St. John, the, John the disciple, the beloved disciple, the apostle. We note here that it's the second feast after Christmas. So the first feast was St. Stephen yesterday, who was a proto-martyr. And then today, the proto-loved, the first loved, the first martyr yesterday, St. Stephen, reminding us that our Lord Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sins, and all of us that are the followers of Christ must be ready to die as St. Stephen died. And whoever is not ready to shed his blood because of the beauty and glory of Christ is not a follower of Christ and knows nothing about his coming. And then the second saint we consider is today, the first of all the twelve apostles that are saints, to be considered in the liturgical year, and that is St. John, the beloved disciple. And he is the first in love. He flies above all the other apostles. But a few considerations concerning this great apostle, St. John. We note here that St. Peter himself recognized there's something sacred about this man, John. He was 16 years old when he met our Lord Jesus Christ and became a disciple. But remember, though he was 16 years old, he was already one of the leaders of the, of the shipping company that St. Peter, James, and John belonged to. On that day, there were two boats. There was Simon Peter's boat and the other boat, which both caught fish. And the other boat was the boat of St. John and his brother James. And James was older than John. But St. John was one of those characters who was such a great and powerful leader. He was called the Son of Thunder. He was extremely intelligent. He was extremely strong-willed and powerful in character. He understood men and how to deal amongst men. Remember that when uh, the Good Friday came, St. John already knew all the guards. He knew all the ways in and out of the temple, and he was able to go in freely and go out even when Jesus Christ was being crucified. And even when he did not believe that he would rise from the dead, he didn't believe that there was going to be any victory, but he had such a character and such a way with men that he knew his way around the guards. He knew his way through the prison. And he was able to get St. Stephen, I mean St. Peter, in the gates with him. Also, we note that of the apostles, he was the youngest apostle. But though St. John was the youngest apostle, he was a born leader of the apostles. 30-year-old men, 
25 and 30 year old men, some in their 30s, the apostles, they were ready to follow John. They recognized this one had a special character. And the only reason why James got special privileges was because he was the brother of John, even though St. James was older. And remember also the ambition of St. John. When, he, when during the course of those three and a half years in which he was being formed to become a saint and had not yet become that saint, he was the one that called down fire from heaven. He was extremely angry when he, and he saw this city was not going to follow Christ. He would not let them come into that, into that city. And he said to Jesus Christ, recognizing his power, if he has the power to cure, if he has the power to raise from the dead, then he has the power to put the enemies of God to death. And therefore he called upon Jesus Christ, bring fire thunder from heaven and destroy that city. And he meant it with the fullness of his power and fullness of his strength, uh, fullness of his faith. And yet our Lord said to him, you know not of what spirit you speak. He did not condemn John for asking thunder to come from heaven, but rather the spirit with which he spoke it. For it was a spirit of pride and the spirit of anger and the spirit of vengeance, and it was not the spirit of God. The Spirit of God does call down fire and thunder upon people from time to time, such as Sodom and Gomorrah, and in multiple other times. So 40,000 soldiers of Sennacherib were killed by God. The firstborn of Egypt killed by God. And many times God did call down upon his wrath. All the soldiers of Egypt wiped out by the water on the day of crossing the Red Sea by the anger of God. So God's anger does suddenly wipe out his enemies. And, he, and also Joshua. With the spirit of Jesus Christ inside of him. He, his name is this Jesus of the Old Testament. He has the same name as Christ. And with the spirit of Christ, he said, Go not down, thou sun, go not down, thou moon, but you stay in the air so that I might kill all the enemies of God. He didn't care about his own personal enemies, but he was going to wipe out the enemies of God. And God obeyed Joshua's anger. And the sun stood still in the heavens that he might have good, clear light for the space of an extra day to kill the enemies of God. So therefore, when John, St. John said, call down thunder from heaven, God was not upset that he called down thunder from heaven, but rather about the spirit that guided him to say it. St. John always had the right understanding in his heart, even when he didn't have the right understanding in his brain. He always knew where to be. He always knew what to do. He was the most gifted of all the twelve apostles, and when those gifts were sanctified, when those gifts were filled with Christ, he was the greatest of those apostles. It was also known concerning the apostles that there were twelve men that followed Jesus Christ. One was the head, he was St. Peter. There were other gifted apostles, but there was only one whom Christ loved. When we read the Gospel of St. John, every time, except for in this verse that's in the, in the Gospel today, Every time, except the very end of the Gospel, he does not mention his own name. St. John, when he, in his Gospel, he says, Peter and the one whom Christ loved were there. Peter and the one whom Christ loved ran to the tomb. Peter and the one whom Christ loved had his head upon the heart of Jesus Christ during the supper. And Peter spoke to the one whom Christ loved, and he said to ask him, Can you ask Jesus Christ a question? Not only did he have a way with men, he had a way with God. In this way, he was a true son of Abraham. Because it is said of Abraham that Abraham was able to argue with God. He was able to discuss with God. And he was a true son of Israel. Jacob, which means the usurper, one day he fought with an angel because the angel, he, remember Jacob asked the angel, Who are you? What is your name? And the angel said, I'm not going to tell you my name. Goodbye. And Jacob became angry. And he said to the angel of God, you're not telling me your name, you're not going goodbye. And he grabbed the angel and he wrestled with the angel the entire night. <laughs> he did not grow tired in the fight. Now the spirit of Jacob was inside of John. The, the ability to argue and make business and to discuss with people and get his way was, was, of Abraham was also inside of St. John. There was the best part of Abraham and the best part of Jacob inside of him. And when Jesus Christ saw that young boy, 16 years old, 17 years old, 18 years old, he saw the spirit of Abraham. He saw the spirit of Jacob. And remember in the morning, the angel fought all night. And he said, you're pretty tough, he said to Jacob. You asked my name. I will not give it to you. Because you have fought so well, I will give you a new name, for you are now Israel, because you have fought with God. 
And Israel means to fight with God. And the spirit of fighting with God is in Jesus Christ. When he said, when you ask for help, don't ask nicely. Ask with impurity. Ask with vengeance. Ask with a, with a vindictiveness, with a conviction of heart. And this was inside of St. John. He was driven, his heart was driven by a power, by an ambition that at first he was going to use only for his own aggrandizement, only for his own betterment. But as time progressed, just by being around Jesus Christ during those three and a half years, he slowly, slowly changed his heart. Now remember the ambitious St. John, that he was, he was the one who got his mother to go to our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, right now, Peter is the head of the apostles. But he shouldn't be the head. I should be the head. And therefore, I want you, my <coughs> mother, to go and speak to Jesus Christ and say, Can you put my sons, one at the right, the other at the left? James would not be at the right, older brother or not. Only John would be the one at the right. And James at the left only because he's the brother of John. And for no other reason, he was tolerated only because he was his brother. And therefore he said to his mother, go and speak to Christ. He likes listening. He listens to women. He listens to them. So you go and speak to Christ. And here's what you're going to tell him. And when he said this, he had the spirit of Rebecca inside of him. Because she was able to say to Jacob, Say these things to your father, and speak this way to your father, and you will get what you want. But unfortunately, John was using these things for his own betterment. And our Lord was not that angry. It's interesting how <coughs> when St. Peter said, don't be crucified, and St. Peter was worried about Jesus Christ's suffering, our Lord became extremely angry. And he said, get behind me, Satan. You don't tell me what to do. But when St. John said, take Peter and move him aside, make me the boss, make me the head of every one of the apostles, make me the number one in your kingdom, and let James be my, my sidekick, he did not become so angry. And why was that? He did not like the ambition of St. John, but he loved his spirit. And he loved his drive, <clears throat> that there was something good inside of that drive of that young man. And he had, therefore, he said to him, or he said to his mother, tell James and John, they shall. Either he asked the question, can you suffer what I'm going to suffer? Can you take the difficulties I will take? And they said, we will take it. And then St. John, our Lord said to them, you shall take it. For you shall die as I died. You shall suffer as I suffered. But to who is on the right and on the left, it is already decided by the Father. He was very gentle in his reproof. And he very gently set aside. Most of us, when we see this kind of anger and pride and ambition, we become extremely harsh. He was very harsh with Peter, but very gentle with St. John. And all the other apostles knew why. It's because he's the brat. Because he's the special apostle. He doesn't. When Peter said, Saint, Our Lord, don't be crucified, he got his head bit off. St. John says, I want to take over and rule the kingdom. He said, well, that was not the best idea in the world. He didn't get his head bit off. And the apostles fought amongst themselves. But why did Jesus Christ act this way? He was forming the heart of St. John. He was watching his heart change from this a bit too proud and too gifted boy to a saint. He was transforming his whole being. But he didn't want to crush his drive. He didn't want to crush his spirit. He wanted to become sanctified. He wanted to have a true greatness. And therefore, when, that, when our Lord Jesus Christ died... And he was 19 years old. It was John that knew what to do. He did not know that it was the Last Supper. He didn't know there would be no other meals with Christ, no other time with Christ. He'd be crucified in the morning. He knew nothing of that and didn't believe it. But he recognized this is a sacred night and I must pay close attention for my master is speaking in a way that he's never spoken before. And he put his head upon the heart of Jesus Christ. Later on, he wrote a gospel of 21 chapters. And in that gospel of 21 chapters, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 will be devoted to those three hours in the entire life of Christ in which he put his head upon the heart of Christ and listened. And he spread to the whole world what this is about. And remained always a son of thunder. When he was in his 90s, that he wrote the gospel of St. John. They asked him to write a gospel, to write another life of Jesus Christ, though it was already written by St. Matthew and Mark and St. Luke, that he must also write a gospel. And he began by saying, I am writing a gospel. 
The gospel about my master, about Jesus Christ, who was born in Bethlehem. But how did he begin that gospel? He said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And without God, there is, without him, there was, all things were made through him, and without him was made nothing that has been made. All things are made through him. This is God. He became so, his whole being became focused only on God. And he saw God in all things, and all things in God. And then he is the one who told us what God is. Deus caritas est. These are the words of St. John in his epistle. That God is charity. That God is love. And he began to see this divine love as he traveled through his life. He put his hand on the heart of our Lord, and then... When our Lord rose from the dead, again, he did not know what to do or what to say. But when the Mary Magdalene came back and said that, she, that the tomb was empty and she had seen the Lord, he did not believe, and neither did St. Peter, but they ran to the tomb. And he was the first apostle to see Christ, uh, the evidence of Christ's resurrection and to believe. So that our Lord would even speak of him when he spoke to St. Thomas eight days later and said, Thomas... Because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. But blessed are they who have not seen and have believed. And the first one to not see and believe of the, of the resurrection was St. John. And he was not blind in his belief. He looked at the evidence. He saw the shroud folded. He saw the 100 soldiers gone. He saw the stone rolled back. He heard the testimony of Mary Magdalene, whom he realized was a very wise lady and would not speak foolishly, and she was a worthy witness. And he put all the pieces together and recognized that he must have risen from the dead. And the only answer to what had happened was his resurrection. And therefore he believed. He was able to believe, says St. Augustine, because though he had many faults, and though he was strong of character, what made him able to see most clearly was his angelic purity. He was the most pure, of most chaste of all the apostles. And that he was, in his purity gave him a clarity of mind. Then the time came that... We have the last words recorded of St. John in the Holy Gospel. And these are recorded 15 days after the death of our resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When St. Peter said to John and, and three other disciples, or five of them, let's go fishing. And they went fishing. And as they were fishing, they fished all night and caught nothing. They said, it's good to go fishing again. But the morning came and a stranger came on the shore. And notice that St. John did not recognize the stranger. He didn't recognize him. He didn't even recognize him when he said, Did you catch anything last night, young men? No, we didn't catch anything. Well, then why don't you take your net and throw it over the right side? He said, Okay, we'll do that. And they threw it over the right side. And they picked up 153 fish, which signify all those that are going to be saved. When St. John picked up 153 fish, St. Peter saw 153 fish, and St. John saw Christ. And therefore we have his last recorded words in the gospel where he turned to St. Peter and he said, It's the Lord. That's all he said. It's the Lord. And here we see the power of the apostle. When Christ is inside the apostle, when Christ is inside of him, when he says, It's the Lord, something happens. So many times since St. Since John spoke those words, they have been spoken hundreds of thousands, millions of times in the last 2,000 years. But when St. John said it, it's the Lord. What happened? Christ entered Peter's heart. St. Peter was driven to go to the shore only 60 feet away, but the boat would take too long to get to the shore, so he put on a cloak and he jumped in the water and he swam to the shore. And St. John did not swim to the shore, for he left Peter and each time with Christ. But all he said was, it's the Lord. And when he was an old man, and it was the said of the people of Ephesus complained about their bishop, the last of the apostles, to die, around the year 100 A.D. And when he was in his last age, they asked him, St. John, what should I do about my wife problem? What should I do about my husband problem? What should I do about my children problem? What should I do about the fact that Romans are trying to kill us? What should I do in business? What should I do in all my troubles? What are we to think about the things that are going on? And he said, love God. The answer to your wife's troubles are, love God. To your husband's troubles are, love God, for God is love. And they got tired of hearing these answers. But in fact, if you look at the sun, what's it made out of? Nothing. Why is it hot? Why is it so big? Why is it everything that it is? Because God spoke 
and let the sun be in the sky. And whoever knows the sun perfectly knows God in every single part of the sun. And whoever knows the earth and all living things perfectly knows only God in these things. And St. John, as he grew in wisdom and he grew in age, he saw God in everything, and the love of God is the answer to a bad wife. The love of God is the answer to a bad husband and bad children. The love of God is the answer to all troubles. And therefore he was not getting senile. He simply said, Deus caritas est. God is charity, God is love, and love God, and all troubles shall be taken away. And all he did in all circumstances is point. It's the Lord, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. And also lastly, we know concerning St. John, that he has the greatest privilege of standing at the foot of the cross in the name of all of us. And consider the journey of salvation. Our Lord Jesus Christ sees his mother at the foot of the cross. And only she is the mediator of all grace. But then what did he say to her? Woman, behold thy son, St. John. Son, behold thy mother. And for the next 15 years, the last 15 years of Blessed Virgin Mary on the earth, all that he did was he beheld her, he took care of her until the day of her assumption into heaven and being crowned the queen of heaven. And so that how is it that we are saved? Because Christ sees us in the arms of Mary. And what about the Blessed Virgin Mary? What does she look for? She looks for her son. The one that is transformed into her son is St. John the Apostle. She looks for the beloved disciple. She looks for what's in the heart of that disciple to be inside of us. So St. John is therefore not only a disciple, but he is very intimately related to all of our salvation because we are all saved in his name. When God said, I'm from the cross, woman, behold thy son. And it was John that was standing there, the beloved disciple. And he said to the beloved disciple, behold thy mother. And as St. Augustine says, consider those 12 apostles. Before that day of the crucifixion, they made so many mistakes because they had Jesus Christ, but they had not the mother. But once they had the mother, once they beheld her, they never ever turned back to sin. And they stayed faithful until the day of their, of their, of their passing. And one last thing, St. John, our Lord said to St. John and James, Will you suffer like I suffer? And they said yes. And skeptics have pointed out, wait a minute. Jesus Christ died the death of a martyr. Jesus Christ shed his blood upon the cross. James shed his blood, but John did not. John died of old age. He was never put to death. And yet Jesus Christ said, Both of you shall die as I die. What about that? Did Jesus Christ predict the death of both of them by martyrdom, but only one would be a martyr and he got it wrong? He says, No. Both died as Christ died. Like Jesus. James, Jesus Christ was shed, was shed his blood, but he did not die like James, because James died because he was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple and he smashed his bones and died. Jesus Christ did not die from crucifixion. He did not die from asphyxiation. He did not die from the wounds put him from the outside. He died of an act of love. He died of an act of charity at the moment of his own choosing. And this, the death of St. John, was more like Jesus Christ's death than the death of St. James. And therefore, when Christ said, you shall both die as I have died, it is true, for James died by blood, with the, given for the sake of love, but John died only of love. And here he is so much more like unto Christ, and he truly has the crown of martyrdom. He has the crown of martyrdom because he was boiled in oil, though he was not harmed by it, not in the slightest harm, but he gave he is a crown of martyrdom because he died of love. He truly died of love. And hence he is truly the disciple of love. And remember also, they said of him, Saint Peter, what's going to happen to Saint John? You see, what's going to, what are you going to do with him? And he said, He shall stay until I come. And the word spread that Saint John is going to live to the end of the world, because Christ said, He shall stay until I come. He didn't say he was going to die. And Saint John responded and said, the Lord did not say that I, John, would not die. He simply said that I, will, I must stay until he come. And what is it that brought about the death of St. John? Jesus Christ came from heaven in the flesh. And he came to St. John. And he came and he brought him into the kingdom of heaven. He died and he truly died. He did physically and truly die, St. John did. But when did he die? At the time that Jesus Christ came. And so it is the death of all the saints. 
They do not die by the hands of the enemies. They do not die at the moment that our enemies want us to die. But they die when Jesus Christ comes. All are determined by that. In any case, we try to follow the example of the beloved disciple, St. John, and let his heart be inside of us, and let us stand at the side of the Holy Mother like he did, and carry her in our, in our hearts and in our homes, and then we'll be ready to truly be going with Christ when he comes to get us at the day of judgment. Close God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.